Welcome to episode 34 of the Serious About Security podcast for April 8th, 2013. Brought to you by the Center for Education and Research and Information Assurance and Security, or Sirius, at Purdue University. I'm Preston Wiley, and I'm joined again this week by Keith Watson and Mike Hill. And uh, we'll have the first article, which is Mike's. Thanks, Preston. Um, today marks a significant day. We are exactly one year away from the end of life for Windows XP support. Uh, mark your calendars. April 8th, 2014, uh, Microsoft will terminate its extended support for XP. Um, so I thought this was a, a, an interesting article to discuss today, uh, given the fact that it is exactly one year away. Um, looking back, because uh, I could not actually remember when XP was originally released, but it was in fact 2001 that it initially came out. So it's sort of uh, um, odd that it's been over 10 years and it's still being supported by Microsoft. Uh, and I know they've extended the support before. Um, so it, the question becomes, um, will they stick to this date? Uh, everything I read indicates that they will. In fact, I believe you have to be on Service Pack 3 now in order to get the updates. Um, what's interesting is there's still a large number of users that are using XP. It is the second most popular system uh, behind Windows 7 and just barely behind Windows 7. Uh, so with, with that many users out there, and, and less in, I guess, just about a year to go now. Is everyone, our business is going to really be able to, to shift over in time? And, and what's the net effect if they don't? Um, you know, are, are the hackers out there just waiting for a year from now to really go after these XP systems? Um, because the, the landscape's going to totally change from a year from now. Uh, with those XP systems no longer able to get updates, um, then any new vulnerability that's discovered will just be accessible for all time. Uh, do you think Microsoft will um, back off of this and, and still provide what would be called, I guess, critical security updates? Uh, or do you think they are finally going to move away from XP and really force users over to using either Vista, uh, Windows 7, or Windows 8? What are your thoughts? Uh, I think they should have killed the product like eight years ago. That's just my personal opinion. Uh, I think the problem is we're going to have a lot of people for a long time, even after this year deadline, still using XP and maybe not aware of the issues with it. Uh, I think these could be a lot of mom and pop users who bought surprisingly reliable hardware and XP was installed on that machine and they never had the need or the desire or the money to upgrade it. So a lot of home users, I don't think this is going to change anything for them. They're going to say, oh, XP works for me, you know, it's going to continue using it. Now the businesses, on the other hand, they've got a little more of an issue. It, obviously they've been after Microsoft to support it a little longer than I think Microsoft really wanted to. And so those those folks are really going to have the biggest challenge and, and they should have had a plan a long time ago to update and move on, but uh, not everybody moves as quickly. Well, I, 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 I agree. I think XP has been kind of on, on uh, the Microsoft's, they wanted to kill it for quite a while, but they've left it open because I guess people were willing to pay for support. Uh, for it, and uh, I mean, we hit a. I think I think Microsoft hit a what I would say a a turning point maybe uh, last year in that Windows Seven uh, finally exceeded uh, Windows XP on the number of uh, systems uh, that were using it. So so now Windows Seven is the top operating system. While well, last year at this time, uh, Windows XP was still number one on. I mean, even you know, uh, 11 years after its release, it was the top Microsoft operating system out there. But but in, uh, it looks like according to this graph, uh, July of 2012, Windows 7 finally uh, went, went uh, above and, and is, is now the number one OS. And I think that is significant, uh, but, you know, it's XP still being used by about... 39% of all of all desktop operating systems on the market. So, um, 
I think uh, I, I agree with Keith. It won't change the desktop user. If somebody has Windows XP, they're going to keep using it until their computer dies, and they're going to have to buy a new one or whatever. But from a business standpoint, it, it means something. I mean, some people, I mean, there's some people uh, that are still using Windows 98 because they have applications that require Windows 98 to run. And, and it's, I mean, there's, there, you can't do anything about those, unfortunately. But, uh, but hopefully we'll see uh, after, in a, in a year, maybe, maybe uh, people will, will drop it for something newer. Yeah, I, I'm really surprised there's such a large number. Um, I, I guess it just demonstrates that this was a very successful operating system for Microsoft, um, which makes me wonder, people have been so hesitant to move away from it that um, I, I just think in reality there's going to be a large number of individuals come a year from now that, that have not moved. Um, and, and I agree with both your comments that you know your average home user, desktop user, uh, probably won't care and may not even be aware of it uh, necessarily. But, but businesses should be, should be aware and, and should be planning and, and have a process in place. And I just I can't figure out what the justification would be for businesses to stay with it for so long other than there was legacy applications that they, I guess, really needed that, that would not run on the newer system. Uh, but again, there's, you know, there's been workarounds for that, such as running a virtual machine and running XP within that. So, um, you know, I just wonder with that many users, you know, if a year from now we've seen Microsoft shift the date before, I wonder if they will will stick to it. Uh, everything indicates that they will, but but I really wonder when the pressure is applied, uh, whether they'll carry out or if a year from now we'll be talking about how it's got another six months to go or something like that. I think it, it you know, from a security perspective, this is the operating system that came out prior to the trustworthy computing initiative at Microsoft in which they really went back and trained a lot of people in secure coding and they trained and they rethought their software development process. A lot of that is outlined in several books from Microsoft Press on how they do this so they could tell others as well. Uh, as well as train their own internal staff. And XP was really the, the one version of operating system prior to that, and it had a ton of security vulnerabilities, primarily due to its architecture and, and also because of the programming practices used and some of the standard programming errors that, that programmers tend typically made in that sort of development. And so it's still suffering from a lot of vulnerabilities today. Now, I am not going to say that Windows 7 or Windows 8 has less, but I think they've had fewer in comparison to XP over time. And part of that could be the result of that trustworthy computing initiative. So it would be really advantageous for Microsoft to figure out how to get rid of this stuff. The other issue here is in when I worked at Sun, we did what was called at that time sustaining development, which was, you know, maintaining uh, existing code bases for products that had been released, you know, several years prior. And the sustaining engineering teams, um, they don't really want to work on fixing bugs all the time, and they, they uh, would much rather be developing new code, obviously. So there's a, an issue, especially when you have a product that's reaching 12 years old, of maintaining your sustaining development teams that can still be around to know the code base and to know what and where and when and how to fix bugs in the extremely old code like that. And that is probably becoming a challenge for Microsoft to maintain those teams as well. All right, well, we can move on to the second article, which is Keith's. Okay, so. Some interesting stuff in the world of Bitcoin going on um, as of last week. And that's mainly uh, due to the sharp rise in the price of Bitcoins. And at the, at the time the articles were written that we're talking about today is April 4th, uh, they reached a high of 142. And according to Mt. Gox, currently the price of Bitcoin is at $183 on their exchange. Now what's interesting here is that now that it has reached this level of price and if you consider the value of all the bitcoins in circulation uh, the, the total market value of this of this currency is now over a billion dollars. 
So now suddenly you've got the attention of people who may want to take advantage of that. And so over the past few days, uh, Mt. Gox, which is a Tokyo-based exchange, has been suffering from a den distributed denial of service attack. And so that is kind of limiting uh, account holders' access to the service. And the other interesting thing is that either because people are actually interested in Bitcoins now or because of their, they're now suddenly aware of them, or there's some nefarious activity going on, they've had a sharp number in increases in the number of accounts created. So in the previous year, they had you know roughly 9,000 new accounts, and in the last three months, they've had 57,000 new accounts. So they're not really talking a little bit about what that means, whether these are legitimate account holders or something else going on. But I think the the notice is out that Bitcoin is very interesting and there's a lot of money involved and people are trying to take advantage of that. So in addition to the distributed denial of service attack, we have a couple other things going on that are very interesting. If you know how Bitcoins work, they have to be mined um, in order to create new Bitcoins. And currently the uh, process of doing that is basically using a lot of math and cryptography and once you can generate uh, bitcoins and the rate is currently approximately and I'm looking for it real quick here um, anyways I think the number you can make is like 25 bitcoins every 10 minutes and then that level will will cut in half to 12 and a half bitcoins in the next year and then it keeps having until we reach the total of 21 million bitcoins uh, that can be generated that's kind of the finite limit on that anyways the point is that you have to generate a, you have to devote a lot of computing resources in order to to mine bitcoins so there's currently an attack out right now that takes advantage of problems in Skype and it's malware that basically steals some processing power from victims computers in order to mine bitcoins for the attacker so there's that going on that's fun and then in addition to that there's another service called insta wallet which is a way of having your bitcoin stored in an online account and insta wallet suffered a, a pretty significant database breach as so so significant that uh, they've go they're going to cease operations indefinitely uh, because they the architecture they're using uh, was really vulnerable and uh, there's no way to recover the current service in its current form and so they're talking to their current customers to get some of that uh, those bitcoins back to them so what we've got here is a an electronic currency that it really has no government backing it at all. There's no, there's no gold anywhere in a vault somewhere backing this currency. There's no government, you know, that currently prints bitcoins or anything like that. These are all peer-to-peer -peer exchanged and verified currency. And it appears that some people now that the price has reached the level of interest, if you will they are now attacking the infrastructures that exist for Bitcoin exchange and I think they're trying to manipulate the market they're either trying to lower the price of bitcoins so they can buy low and then turn around and stop the attacks and then have the price rise again and then you know sell at a higher price or maybe they're shorting the value of the currency um, you know you you Anyways, you know, shorting uh, is a way to do that. You know, with with stock, maybe you can do that with Bitcoin currency as well. I'm not sure how all that would work, but uh, it's just a lot of interesting things going on right now, um, and it will be interesting to see how this plays out. I'm not currently a, a Bitcoin holder. I don't know if I ever will be uh, at the price it's trading at, uh, but also the you know the uncertainty of the currency itself so I, th I thought this is very interesting I think it's kind of a fact that you know it's now that's risen in price a lot more people are now interested in it and they want to take advantage of the infrastructure to maybe manipulate the price a little bit and if you compare that to trying to ma manipulate currency in a, of a country it's much more difficult to do that because you have to attack it from several fronts but this you know by attacking one of the major Bitcoin exchanges um, they've been able to do that and so this is very interesting I think
Well, one thing that I find uh, interesting about bitcoins is that I think the the pure digital nature of them. I mean, if you if you're able to break into just a bank that handles, say, U.S. currency, and are able to initiate an electronic transfer of money between a bank and another bank, they can easily reverse that. They can they can they can look at it and say, oh well, this was a bad transfer. We reverse it. The charges and you know money doesn't. No money changes hands with bitcoins. Basically, if you if you if you take this digital cryptographic function thing, then you have the currency. It's like being able. You, it's it's like being able to go into a bank and and raid the vault uh, just on just use it via a computer. Obviously, you can't do that with physical money, but with digital money, you know you can you can break into a digital bank, steal digital money, and and essentially tr trade it for for physical currency using a different exchange or whatever. So you can actually steal money completely over the internet with this digital money, and I don't think that's been the case with, with any government-backed uh, currency. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why it's, it's so targeted. It's because you can do that, and you can't with with a lot of other with other things. I mean, you can steal a little bit and get away with it, but you have to do it in in you know you have to target millions of people to steal you know millions of dollars. Well, this you can target one exchange, take their bitcoins, and you've just, just you know come up with a big haul. Sure, I, I, I'm not sure the analogy works well. If I if I go to a bank and I and I steal all the money, all the cash in the vault, I still have stolen all their cash, and I can still use that. And most of it's, let's say, untraceable. Right, but you have to actually physically go there. Yes, physically, physically, or I do with have this, to go you there. You do not have to physically go to right, a bank right. and do it. You can just do it from your computer. Right, and there there were a couple of vulnerabilities in some Bitcoin uh, wallet software. Not the on. I don't think it was the online variety, but there was someone that claimed that their computer got hacked and their Bitcoin wallet got broken into, and all the bitcoins were stolen from it. So yes, the, that analogy does work. The risk of breaking into a Bitcoin repository is significant, orders of magnitude, in my opinion, less risky than it is breaking into a bank and stealing their money from their vault. Right, and even if you did that through an online attack on a, on an online bank there's still lots of laws and lots of federal uh, you know FBI guys that would be hunting you down I don't think the same is true if there was a Bitcoin exchange knocked over that the FBI would be on the case exactly and I think one one of the aspects of bitcoins is they're designed to be practically untraceable as well so some of the design and the currency kind of lends itself to making it a lot easier to steal Yes. Yeah, you're kind of describing a perfect storm for the cyber criminals. Um, it's a high reward, low risk opportunity. Um, if they can't succeed, oh well. If they can, they can virtually walk away untouched. Um, so, you know, it's not surprising that that they're becoming becoming targeted. Um, what I found interesting is that um, they did have. Um, they did have Prolexic, I believe is how you pronounce it. Um, you know, they're paying Prolexic to kind of protect their site from these distributed denial of service attacks, and yet um, it seemed to be unsuccessful. So I think that just indicates they're, they're getting hit with a with a lot a lot of traffic. Uh, one of their tweets was, you know, they could confirm they were eating DDoS right now, and for some reason Prolexic didn't block it. So um, that was a tweet from Mount Gox. So they they clearly were already had Prolex working for them to try to prevent these things, and still it was was ineffective. So uh, I think that just indicates they're they're a very high target right now. Yep. Um, it'll be interesting to see if any governments actually want to jump in here and and say something about it. I mean, we really haven't heard much about it. Most of it is, you know, international exchange uh, going on right now. There's some some people that are 
looking at you know extending what you can do with this currency currently in terms of hedge funds uh, it'll be interesting to see what comes of that I mean really the value of a Bitcoin is is determined by the market right now and so I feel it has value I'm gonna pay a certain price for it and as bitcoins become more accessible in the sense that I can start buying services or products with them then the, the interest in them will only grow so I think you know, we gotta kinda, we gotta have to see what happens here. If there's an interest in using bitcoins, not just as an investment vehicle, where you know buying and selling, uh, you know, on speculation of that it's going to go up, for example. If we get to the point where we actually use it in a transaction that is for product or service, then there's going to be a lot more interest in it. Then there's going to be a lot more people after it as well, because I think at that point the price is going to go up even higher. But and that's when it'll get interesting. Won't these attacks, though, I mean, ultimately, if they're successful and they continue, won't that ultimately drive the prices down and, and it could. even ultimately it could. drive them out of business? I mean, Absolutely, if it, it could, um, it, because you're now you're, uh, lowering confidence in the currency. And before, you know, right now, you know, the U.S. dollar has a high confidence because of the U.S. economy as bad as it might be right now it's still pretty good compared to everybody else so there's there's a high confidence in US dollars whereas there's a low confidence in uh, or lower confidence let's say in euros because of the various companies uh, countries involved in the in the EU having their financial difficulties but there's still there's a confidence value here and if the attacker erodes that confidence then the value of the currency probably will drop so we have these two competing things. We've got attackers bringing the confidence down, and yet the use of Bitcoin's going up. So who knows what's going to happen? Well, the other thing, drawing of my previous analogy, is if I put my money in a bank, in a U.S. bank, and, and the bank gets robbed, then I, and it's FDIC insured, you know, up to, I, th I don't know what it is, 100000 or $250,000 right now. With Bitcoins, there's no backing, there's no insurance. Uh, InstaWallet said they'd refund balances under 50 bitcoins. If you have more than 50 bitcoins, then you're you're that's hosed. on a case by case basis. So you, you know you're you're hosed. Essentially. You may not get your full. Yeah, you may not get back. your money back, and and that's that's about at current rates. Uh, according to this article, that's about six thousand four hundred dollars. So I mean, there's there's a there's a significantly higher risk of having bitcoins in a in a bitcoin bank or or whatever than there is of me putting my physical currency into a US bank um, if it gets robbed or, or, or whatever so I, I think the confidence there is you know I, I'm pretty confident that if I put money in a US bank you know I'm gonna have my money no matter what happens where even with the I guess even with the euro and you look at the stuff that happened happened in Europe that's you know there's a little bit less confidence with the euro as well when it comes to if you put it in a bank are you going to be able to get it get it back out and bitcoins it's even even less I'm, I would be even less confident that I'd be able to get my bitcoins back if I put them in a bitcoin bank well you have the real opportunity too for hackers to manipulate the value uh, and there's a significant opportunity there if they could somehow become successful at it. I mean, if they can hit it with a few attacks, you know, bring the price down, buy up a lot, let things stabilize, you know, it goes up, you know, five, ten dollars, there's a significant opportunity to make a lot of money in that range. And then they can, you know, hit it again. I mean, if they if they were doing this in an organized manner, they could really disrupt the price. Uh, and I don't think their end point would be to want to make Bitcoins go away. I think they would recognize the opportunity of being able to control the price. If they can control the price and make it fluctuate, there's huge opportunities for those folks that could do that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you could attack it and lower the price, buy up a ton of them, and then let it rise on its own after that, and then turn around and sell them, and then turn around and attack it again, yeah, absolutely. You're going to create a cycle in which you can manipulate the price and make a lot of money doing it. The problem is that 
There's no, there's no SEC to monitor this exchange. It's just going to happen, and people are going to, uh, a lot of what we would call serious investors are going to lose out on it. Uh, but then the question is, well, how serious are you when you play with a high risk currency like this? So right, there, there's no there's no government to 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 regulate this thing, and there never there never will be. That's kind of the point of it. Exactly. The point is it avoids governments and 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 has no traceability and and things like that. And that's the point of the currency, but it's also kind of a uh, I'd say a detriment to the currency also. But yeah, anyway, what uh, one last point on this? Um, we talking we're talking about exchanging existing bitcoins. The other op the other opportunity here is to go and mine your own bitcoins. So if you look at it them from that point of view, if you could generate enough compute or gather enough computing resources to go and ge and create your own mine your own bitcoins, you you're kind of creating your own currency. So there's nothing that you bought other than the hardware and the power to run your 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 cluster to to mine these things. So, but and that's what the attackers are doing with the Skype malware. Is like they're borrowing everybody else's computing resources to mine their own bitcoins. So that's another way to put more bitcoins into circulation, but also to make a little cash on the side from it. So, interesting well, I have. Stuff. I guess I have one more interest comment on the interestingness of this. Is that um, as time goes on, these things, bitcoins are just going to get lost. I mean, it's it's going to happen. They're just going to go away. You know, people are going to their hard. If you if you have a bitcoin stored in your hard drive and you wipe out your hard drive, your bitcoin is lost forever, and it's not yeah, coming back. Yeah, well, you know, it's similar to saving your your family photos, right? You you better have multiple backups of that. Right. Well, think about a bank. You know, who has a bunch of bitcoins coins and somehow they're they lose all their data I, I mean we're talking about you know all of these hundreds of thousands of bitcoins going away yep. potentially and, and and that that that's a that would be that would that would be a that would be a, a make bitcoins just jump in price I mean a huge jump if a hundred thousand went away just overnight yes yep but anyway, uh, with that, we'll wrap up this uh, episode. Uh, uh, thanks to Keith Watson and Mike Hill. I'm Preston Wiley. Have a safe and secure day.